Good morning all. In today's session of operating system, we'll be dealing with various CPU scheduling algorithms. So before seeing what are the various CPU scheduling algorithms we have in our syllabus, first we'll see what is the basic need for CPU scheduling. Why do we actually go for CPU scheduling? Now, when you take a case of unique programmed system where you have only a single process and this process will be directly given to the CPU for execution. But when you go for a multi-programmed system where you have multiple process which are present and you have only one particular processor. So in that case, all the processes cannot be executed by a single CPU. So in that case, you have to decide among all these available process, which one is to be given to the CPU. And among these process, some of the process will can be a CPU bond process and some process can be a input output bond process. When I say a CPU bond process, CPU burst time is more. So most of the time the work will be done by the CPU. Whereas in input output bond, the process will be just utilizing your input output resources. The CPU usage will be very less. Now. So as I told you, when you have multiple process present here, we have two softwares that are to be involved. One is your scheduler, the other is your dispatcher. So scheduler takes the responsibility of selecting a particular process from the available process. So this particular selection would be based on the algorithms which we'll be seeing. And once you decide that P1 is to be given to the CPU, you have another software module, which is a dispatcher which takes the responsibility of assigning that particular process to the CPU for execution. Now, having seen what is CPU scheduling, when does it actually occur? So when as we actually go for scheduling, the first case would be when a particular process has terminated or you are making a process to move from a running state to a ready state because of some interrupt or a higher priority process or a case where you are making a running process to wait for input output devices or uh, once the event has occurred, it moves from waiting state to ready state. So in all these four cases, you want a CPU scheduling to take place. And in CPU scheduling, as I told you, we'll be going for using various algorithms, round robin, shortest job, first priority, FCFS, shortest remaining time, and multi-level queue scheduling. In all the algorithms which we have mentioned here, these are the basic computations which we are to be very much clear. Arrival time, burst time and completion time. Arrival time would be the time at which the process enters into the ready queue. The duration of time which is, wait, which is present in the ready queue is your waiting time. The amount of time the process is with the CPU is your burst time. And at last, time at which the process has completed its execution is nothing but your completion time. Based on these times, we will be calculating turnaround time, waiting time and the response time and the formulas accordingly here are turnaround time is nothing but completion time minus arrival time. Waiting time is turnaround time minus the burst time and your response time is your first response minus arrival time. And we even calculate the average values of all these things for each of the algorithms. Now we'll go for the first algorithm, which is nothing but first to come first. So, so in this particular algorithm, overall scheduling or selection of a process will be only based on the arrival time. And if the arrival time of a particular process is not mentioned, we will be taking arrival time by default is equal to zero. Now, when you are a burst time is nothing but amount of time it requires. Based on this, we have to complete the remaining part of the table. Now for that, we have to prepare a Gantt chart. And in the Gantt chart, we'll start with arrival time zero. So when you go for your arrival time zero, this is nothing but first process which has arrived at zero is nothing but P1. And what is the amount of burst time it requires? Three minutes. This unit can be milliseconds, nanoseconds, or it, it can even go for hours. So here we'll consider it as three milliseconds. So it, CPU will be executed, CPU will be given to this particular process for three milliseconds. And once it is done, at three milliseconds, then you again cross check whether there are any process that are has arrived. After zero, what is the next process it has arrived at two milliseconds process two. So you next select the process two for scheduling and will be given to the CPU. And what is the amount of time it requires six. So three plus six would be nine. 
and after 90 milliseconds so this has completed the execution this also has done with the execution now at 9th millisecond what are all the processes that are present in the ready queue p3 p4 p5 but which process would we go for selecting p3 because among all the three which one has arrived first p3 so that that particular process will be selected for execution so here we'll go for p3 and what is the burst time that it requires 4 milliseconds so it would be 13 9 plus 4 would be 13 and the next process would be p4 and which requires 5 milliseconds so it would be 18 and the next process would be 5 because they are in the order of their arrival times and this would be 20 and if you want to cross check whether this scan chart is correct or not you just sum up all the burst times the sum of your burst time should be equal to this value as 20 and once it is done we go for calculating the completion time so whatever times are mentioned here p1 has completed at 3 milliseconds p2 at 9 p3 at 13 p4 at 18 and p5 this we call it as completion time or we can even call it as finishing time sometimes or you can even mention it as an exit time so crosses p1 has completed at 3 milliseconds and p2 at 9 P2 at 9, P3 at 13, P4 at 18, and P5 at 20. And 20. This is your 20. And turnaround time is nothing but your completion time minus your arrival time. So your completion time is 3, arrival time is 0. So 3 minus 0 would be 3. 9 minus 2 would be 7. 13 minus 4 would be 9. 18 minus 6 would be 12 and 20 minus 8 would be 12. Now coming to your waiting time, it is nothing but your turnaround time. Turnaround time minus your burst time. Turnaround times you already calculated 3, 7, 9, 12, 12. 3 minus your burst time is 0, 3, 3 minus 3, 0, 7 minus 6, 1. Uh, 9 for so 9 and what is the burst time 9 minus 4 5 12 minus 5 7 you concentrate on your burst times 12 minus 2 10 similarly we can even calculate your response time the response time is nothing but your first response minus your arrival time so when you see this uh, when was the cpu given to p1 at 0 it so your first response would be 0 p2 first response is 3 P3 first response is 9, P4 first response is 13, P5 first response is 18. So I'll just note, make a note of the response time 0, first response 3, 9, 13, and 18. Now we'll calculate 0 minus what is the arrival time 0 is equal to 0. Arrival time of your second process is equal to 2. Arrival time of your third process is 4. Arrival time of your fourth process is 6. And arrival time of your fifth process is 8, which is 10. So when you just cross check the values, your response time values and your waiting time values would be same because your FCFS algorithm is a non preemptive algorithm. What do you mean by a non preemptive algorithm? As we have already discussed, once the CPU is allotted to a particular process till its completion, the CPU will not be taken from the processor. So after you calculate all these waiting terms, turnaround time and the wait response time, we need to even calculate the average turnaround time. We need to calculate average waiting time and we need to even calculate average response time. So for this, every algorithm, these calculations are compulsory. Now, having seen this FCFS algorithm, so the advantage is it is very simple that you need to only concentrate when it has come and it is a simplest form and it is very easy to write a program. But since it is a non-preemptive algorithm, the process priority will not be considered. And the waiting time when you compare it, it is very high and this particular FCFS will have a convoy effect. Convoy effect is nothing but in general terms, this is a longer job. Longer job is the burst time is very much high. So if this is a first job whose burst time is very high, so I assume it requires 24 hours for its completion, whereas these smaller jobs only requires 1-1 hour. So since it has arrived at 0th millisecond, 
all the shorter jobs has to wait for the longer job so this is a main problem when you go for fcfs and the reason why we call it as convoy effect is when you might have seen when you have a uh, all the vehicles when a vip is entering all the vehicles will be stopped so because of that we get a traffic jam so all the vehicles have to be stopped because of the other vehicles the next algorithm which we have is here is shortest job first i uh, having seen the fcfs which is based on arrival time shortest job which is purely based on your burst time we select the process based on the burst time and that could be either non preemptive or preemptive i'm uh, repeating repeating it once again non preemptive is once you assign a cpu to a particular process you will not leave this cpu until it completes the execution whereas in preemptive mode if a cpu is allocated to a particular process p1 and if you get some other process p2 you just remove this from p1 and assign it p2 so the preemptive mode of shortest job first is nothing but shortest remaining time first the next algorithm which will be dealing here is shortest job first in non preemptive mode so in shortest job first it is purely based on your burst time as we have seen earlier now these are your arrival times of the process and these are your burst times now you just check extra we need to first complete the gantt chart so arrival time zero so among all the process from p1 p2 p5 you check which process is at arrival time zero so it is p4 you check whether are there any other process at the same arrival time no so what you do you directly give this to the cpu but how much amount of time you will be giving it to the cpu 6 milliseconds so p4 is my process which is been allotted to the cpu for 6 milliseconds because it is non preemptive now after 6 milliseconds now you check whether there are any process so it has done with its execution so are there any other process which are in the ready queue yes p2 has, has arrived at 1 millisecond P5 has arrived at 2 millisecond. P1 has arrived at 3 milliseconds. P4 arrived at 4 milliseconds. Now P1, P2, P3, P4 are all all present in the ready queue. Now, based on what will go for selecting a process, it was not on the arrival time. It is based on your burst times. So among all the process, since P4 has done with the execution, which particular process you will be selecting? You will be selecting P1 because the burst time is only one. So we go for allotting the cpu to p1 with a burst time of 1 which is nothing but 7 so since it ha it has done with the execution yes now we'll deal with p2 p3 and p4 now when you see this here p2 p3 and p4 which of these particular process has less burst time again 2 so we need to just give this to p3 and the p3 burst time is sorry b p3 is to be given this is your burst time and for how much amount of time you have to given 2 milliseconds so it is 9 so it has also done its execution now among p2 and p5 whose burst time is less p5 burst time is less so you allot this to the cpu so p5 for how much time 3 milliseconds so it would be 12 it would be 12 now so this is also done with the execution you left out is only p2 and what is the burst time of the p2 here it is nothing but 16 because you have 4 milliseconds now you want to check cross check your gantt chart just add up all your burst times that would sum up your 16 now you have all these process right now we try to fill up this completion time so when you see the completion time as already told in fcfs p1 when did it complete its execution 7 so the completion time of p1 would be 7 p2 where is p2 here and when did it complete at 16 milliseconds and where is your p3 p3 has completed at 9 milliseconds p4 has completed at 6 milliseconds and p5 has completed at 12 milliseconds so this is your completion time and your turn around time would be completion time minus your arrival times so when you see here your completion time is 7 arrival time is this so 7 minus 3 4 16 minus 1 15 these are your arrival times right 9 minus 4 5 6 minus 0 6 turn around time 12 minus 2 would be 10 now coming to its waiting time waiting time would be your turn around time minus your burst time so you need to concentrate on your turn around time and your burst time so these two columns we have to cross check so 
here when you go for seeing this, this turnaround time is 4. And 4 minus 1, it is nothing but 3. 15 minus 4, 11. 5 minus 4, 3. 6 minus 6, 0. 10 minus 3, 7. Now, the next one would be your response time, which is nothing but your first response minus your arrival time. First response, as I told you, it is the time at which the CPU was allocated. So, first we'll write the first response time. So, when you see P4, what is the first response? When did it get at 0? So, here I'll just mention it as 0 minus. We'll update it. P1, when the CPU was given 6. So, 6 minus. P3, when the CPU was given first 7. So, that would be the first response, right? P3, 7 minus. P5, when the CPU was allocated and the first response, it gets at 9th only. So, P5 would be 9 minus. P2, when it did get at 12 milliseconds, 12 minus, right? Now, you need to go for subtracting them with your arrival time. So, the 6 minus 3, 12 minus 1, sorry, 12 minus 1, 7 minus 4, 0 minus 0, 9 minus 2. And as I told you, non-preemptive response time and waiting time would be same. And we need to calculate the average waiting time, average turnaround time, and average response time. In the next class, we'll be seeing about preemptive version of SJF. Thank you. We'll be dealing here is...